Oh, so today, Kristen Snowden will be um, sharing with us about healthy and unhealthy boundaries, and she's prepared a chart. Um, I've included that in the chat feature. If you look at the chat feature, there's a link you can go to so that you can download that. I'm going to be sharing my screen so that as Kristen talks through it, um, you'll be able to follow along so you can just continue to watch this. But that, that's a place if you want to uh, copy and paste that link somewhere, you'll be able to access that after the webinar as well. So, so we're, this is such a huge topic, Kristen. I'm so glad you're going to be talking about this. So um, uh, the link in the email ha ha had not worked. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to try it. It worked for me. So co copy and save it. And um, uh, but you're going to be able to follow along because I'm going to share my screen. So do you want to talk about anything in, but first or should I go ahead and share my screen? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll give a little background for okay. a minute. Perfect. Um, Thank you. I think I'll give some educational background and then dive into it. Let's give a few more minutes to see if anybody yes. else uh, shows up. So uh, today I am going to talk about boundaries, uh, the importance of boundaries. I think along with that word codependence, I feel like boundaries gets thrown around a lot. Uh, there's lots of definitions about them and for them. I think we all know that they're important, but we're not really sure uh, how, how to execute them, where they should uh, appear in our life, and what kind of boundaries contribute to a healthier way of life. So I'm going to be pulling, just so you know, my resources. I'm going to be pulling from um, some Brene Brown information, some Terrence Real, some Pia Melody. A lot of them talk a lot about it. Um, and obviously, recently, too, in, in Rob's Prodependency uh, Prodependence book, he talks about the need for boundaries. So let's, let's start with why boundaries. The goal in, in all relationships, in all intimate relationships, is to have authentic, vulnerable intimacy. And the way we sometimes describe intimacy is into me you see. So you get to see all of me, my good, my bad, my light, my dark. Um, intimacy, when we have intimacy with somebody, we can share uh, physical intimacy, hugs, kisses, sex. We can share emotional or intellectual intimacy and sometimes spiritual intimacy if you have a spiritual practice. Um, so these are all the goals in a healthy relationship. But as you can imagine, if you are sharing intimate thoughts, feelings, physical exchanges, you are being vulnerable. So meaning you're showing up saying that I am imperfect, but I'm a worthwhile and valuable person and I deserve to be loved um, and be lo and love others and authentic. So I'm being honest, even if maybe the truth isn't a cuddly, warm and fuzzy thing. Um, that can expose you to a lot of negativity or a lot of, when you're presenting your raw vulnerable self to someone, they can hurt you even more, right? Because, you know, it's not a facade. You weren't pretending. You were kind of putting it all out there on the line and they might look at you and go, meh, don't like that. <laughs> don't want it. No, thanks. Uh, so there's two things that are really important that you have when you're trying to practice this vulnerable, authentic intimacy with people. Um, and I think that's besides, I guess one thing that I'm thinking of is always just make sure that you've vetted this person, which I think we're going to be talking a little bit more about because a, a lot of us in marriages with betrayal traumas feel like they vetted it um, and they still feel like they got bitten from it. But you have to practice um, self-love, shame resilience. So resilience from that kind of deep down fear and worry that uh, your flaws make you undesirable. 
that your mistakes are something that you should hide and be ashamed of, um, that you have to practice a lot of self-love and resilience from this concept of shame of that I'm not enough, um, that maybe I'm not worthy and valuable. And you need to be resilient against that. The second part is setting boundaries. You have to be able to set boundaries in all relationships. They are our physical boundaries. So um, I'm okay with kissing, hugging you, staying in this space. Uh, and I'm also going to respect somebody else's physical boundaries. You need space. You don't want to be touched, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's emotional boundaries of, you know, this is the way we should be conducting ourselves. This is the words that we should be using. Um, this is what I'm willing to give to you. It, there has to be reciprocity. It's generally what you consider boundaries are what you consider to be okay and not okay for yourself and your own general practices and state of being and then for others. Um, Terrence Real says when you are um, boundaryless, you're connected to people but you're not protected. And then when you're behind that wall of a, an impermeable boundary, let's say, you're protected, but that stops you from being connected. So neither of those things are intimacy and you wanna to try to find a happy medium in between. Um, when you don't have a boundary, you might appear to others or you might think that you appear to others as being kind of the sweet, pleaser, um, kind of the person that is flexible and fun and uh, a, a good time. And, um, but really often you can become passive aggressive from not having boundaries because when you're feeling like people are kind of being mean to you or taking advantage of you, it, it hurts you and it harms you. And uh, you have to have boundaries. I think uh, the way I think about boundaries too, the importance of boundaries is, and again, I'm not a hard scientist person, so please caveat this. Um, I'm more of like a political science slash liberal arts kind of person, but I was helping my daughter uh, work on her science and they were studying like atoms and, and cells and stuff like that. And I always think about that, that it's like humans on this earth level are almost like the atoms and molecules that are bouncing around all around us, which is they're, they are their own entity, but they're constantly bouncing around these other molecules and atoms. Um, they are trying to reach their own, like their own internal balance and homeostasis, but it's also all based on the environment that they're surrounding and their entire existence is about bouncing off and observing and getting feedback from all the other atoms and molecules around them. And I really do feel like that's kind of the human spirit on this earth is, is we're bouncing around, uh, doing our own thing, finding our own balance in life, but we have to be giving feedback to those people around us and they have to be giving us feedback for that to work. Um, and, and that is what boundaries are. Um, it's important to state that you cannot have boundaries it takes a lot of courage to have boundaries because that means that you can't, instead of stating your own personal boundaries, you can't care more about what people think, how they might judge you, if you're pleasing them or making them happier or not. Um, you can't be more focused on being the sweet, easy, flexible, easygoing one. And then you also have to have shame resilience because when you're asking someone to meet a need, when you're asking someone to respect your boundaries, something that you've established, there's always that fear in the back of your head that I, if I ask for this boundary to res be respected, if I ask for this need to be met, will they still like me? Will they want to still be around me? And that can be really, really scary. Um, and the key to loving others and um, the boundaries are the key to loving others and loving yourself. Um, st having boundaries, um, is practicing self-love, self-respect, uh, and then love and respect for others. That provides, believe it or not, the more clear your boundaries are and the more you respect others' boundaries, the more security and safety you can find in a relationship and someone else might find in a relationship. Last two comments before we get into the boundary chart, but 
And I thought it was really interesting. Brene Brown um, did this kind of focus group study with college kids. And she was trying to explore these concepts of boundaries, setting limits, setting rules, trying to do this parenting study. And she asked this group of college age kids, you know, tell me about the limits and the rules that your parents set on you. And she thought it was fascinating that it suddenly became, in, um, became almost like a one-upper where everyone tried to start bragging about how strict their parents were. Oh, well, my curfew was 12 a.m. Well, 12 a.m., I would love 12 a.m. I had to be home by 10 a.m. Well, I couldn't watch, you know, R-rated movies till I was 16 years old. 16, I never even got to watch R-rated. You know, it would turn into this like, oh my gosh, my parents were so strict. And it was like this kind of chest puffing out bragging session. And she said that there was this group of other kids in the room that were almost silent with their head hang, hung low. And, and she took them aside and explored. And it found that they were like almost in shame because the story of their childhood and upbringing is that they didn't have any rules and they didn't have any limits. And uh, they interpret that as, gee, I wonder if my parent, like why didn't my parents love me enough? to set those limits and boundaries and containment because it is that kind of containment and boundaries and limits that does actually create the feeling of safety and security. So it's really interesting to think about that. Sometimes we're afraid to set personal boundaries um, because we're afraid of how people will react to them. But most often the experience is it, it, it just makes it so much easier to understand where you're coming from um, where, where their limits can be in that situation, and it just makes it easier. Um, last comment is compassion, empathy, and love are just, which are all things that are necessary in relationships, right? Because we're all imperfect, but being compassionate towards another, empathizing with their situation, and loving another, none of those are sustainable without boundaries. Because um, you cannot accept or love others. This is um, some of Brene Brown's material. You cannot accept or love others um, if you feel um, you're being hurt or taken advantage of. Uh, and it also helps you hold others accountable and have those uncomfortable conversations. You can accept others while keeping them accountable. Oh, this is something for you guys for, that are struggling with the betrayal trauma. You can practice the compassion and empathy and love, um, but boundaried by accepting and loving the person, but not accepting and loving the behavior. So that kind of allows you, that is boundary setting, right? I love you, but this is not okay. I love you, but I will not tolerate that. You know, and don't forget I think one of the hardest things about boundary setting is whatever you are expecting another to do, you better make sure you're ready to do it yourself, right? So if one of your non-negotiables is no name calling, no calling in the heat of rage, no throwing things, no hitting, whatever, because it'd be unacceptable if someone did that to you, you need to make sure that you're willing and able to practice those same boundaries as well. Um, so that's some general information on boundary setting. Feel free to um, shoot me uh, any questions along those lines. Yeah, anybody uh, use the Q&A at the bottom. Lots about what you said. I was thinking about when you're talking about the atoms. That's a, such a great analogy. And, you know, then um, with my from a long time ago, scientific knowledge, you know, like atoms, you know, form molecules and all of those things. And we're supposed to connect with some of them, but we're not supposed to connect with everybody. And I was thinking if we're not our authentic self, because we're not setting those boundaries, you know, then, you know, then the passive aggressive and all those other mm -hmm. things, you know, come into play, mm -hmm. but, but we're all, we're kind of setting ourselves up for it, you know, not, you know, because we don't have, um, you know, we, we can't be our, authentic self, you know, if we don't have those boundaries. So, um, but, but I, I really like that. And the, you know, the fear of that people won't want to be around me. I, I want people to, that want to be around the real me and right. not the, the illusion of me. Um, that's really nice and wonderful all the time. You know, that's not true, you know? Yeah. And, um, uh, so, so I think, you know, I think it is self-love and self-respect if we set clear boundaries about, um, you know, who we are. Um, I love to what you were talking about with the um, uh, separating the behavior from the person. I can love the person and not like the behavior. 
you know, I can hate the behavior. I can, the mm -hmm. behavior can be hurtful. That doesn't remove my, doesn't have to remove my love for them if there's, you know, the foundation of love. But it's so hard to do that sometimes, you know, if you're just, you know, so betrayed and hurt and angry and everything else. It's, you know, it's so woven together. So I think, you know, backing up and, and finding some clarity of that behavior really hurt me. Um, uh, and, and identifying that as a boundary is really critical for helping move a relationship forward. So very helpful. So shall I share the chart that you created? Yeah. Okay. So um, I have to do this. So I'm, there's a link in the chat feature, but I, I wanted to pull this up to, so you can copy and paste the link and go to that and download it uh, later. But I wanted Kristen to be able to walk you through this as well. So hopefully you can all see my screen. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So do, can you uh, zoom that up so it's just a little bit bigger? Is that possible? If not, it's okay. Oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I guess I don't. I'm trying to make it. I'm tr I, it's on my entire giant screen. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So whatever. I, yeah. You know what? It might be because of my computer screen is small. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so this is a little background. I like telling the background to this uh, chart is I was in um, working with addicts in, in treatment and um, a, a friend, a therapist passed a version of this off. I've kind of updated it and changed it over time. But she was like, oh, here's some material for you. I think this will uh, be helpful for some of your lectures. And I, I, was also, um, I was also in some personal struggles of my own at the time. And I will just never forget the moment where I sat down and read this boundary part um, chart and found that I could highlight far more of the unhealthy boundary behaviors than I could see that I practice any of the healthy boundaries. So I say that to normalize that, you know, here I was lecturing on how to, um, you know, embrace wellness and health and engage in healthy relationships with others when I was struggling with setting healthy boundaries. And this was just, so, so the practice that I took on is I started carrying this chart around and at kind of at the end of every day, I would think of my interaction with my coworkers, with my partner, with my friends and family, when I'm kind of reading this chart and thinking, Kristen, did you, did you hold on? Did you, did you, did you choose to do more of the healthy boundary type behaviors rather than the unhealthy? And it was a muscle that I had to build up. It was really weak. And this was a really concrete way for me to kind of review my behaviors and my choices. So just really um, quick, I'll run through them. Um, can you say no or yes? Um, and are you okay when others say no or, or yes to you? Um, by the way, you can print this out. For, uh, I think she gave the link, but I also on, on my website, you can see that the kristenstonen.com. You can print this out and have it. It's, it's all yours. Do your best with it. Um, uh, Brene Brown uses this soundbite term. She calls, she calls boundary setting, her, her mantra for it is choose discomfort over resentment. So oh, wow. yeah, do, do I choose the discomfort of saying no when I really wish I want to please you and say yes, but I just, I'm tapped out and I can't take on another activity. And so I choose the discomfort of, oh, maybe you won't like me anymore, but I have to say no. Um, or when I think that you rolled your eyes at me and I'm wondering, did you really roll your eyes at me? Do we have a problem here? Um, and I choose the discomfort of having that uncomfortable conversation about, you know, what's going on here? Do we need to talk about things? That's boundaries, you know, and, and that's courage and vulnerability actually. Um, but it's choosing the discomfort of over resentment. So if I said yes, when I'm really tapped out, I'm going to re be resentful and I'm going to do the favor resentfully. If I don't have that conversation with that person, I'm going to be resentful, thinking that they were rolling their eyes at me. So she uses that mantra of, did I choose, resent, or choose discomfort over being resentful of that person? Uh, you have a strong sense of identity and you respect yourself. Do, do you res, um, expect reciprocity in a relationship? Can you share re, um, responsibility and power? Do you know when the problem is yours or when it belongs to someone else? Do 
you share personal information gradually and in a mutually sharing, trusting relationship? Do you tolerate, uh, do you not tolerate any forms of abuse or disrespect? Do you know your own wants and needs and feelings and do you communicate them clearly? Are you committed to and responsible for exploring and nurturing your full potential? Are you responsible for your own happiness and fulfillment? Or do you allow others, um, or you allow others to be responsible for their own happiness and their own fulfillment? Do you value your own opinions and instincts and feelings as much as or more than other people's opinions and feelings? This goes back to that whole gaslighting thing that I was talking about before. Do you let other people um, make you always second guess what you're thinking and what you're feeling? Do you let other people's opinions trump what your gut's telling you? Do you know and respect your limits emotionally and physically? and then allow others and respect their limits? Um, are you able to ask for help when you need it? And do you compromise or maybe you don't compromise your values or integrity to avoid rejection or adversity? These are just a few things that I, um, that I think highlight uh, healthy boundaries. And I think that's about it in the explanation. Oh, one, one other thing that might be helpful for clients on this subject or uh, people listening is that on my website, I have a um, blog on, um, can you switch it back to me? Yep. Mm -hmm. oh. Um, oh, to you? Yeah, yeah. switch it back mm -hmm. to me. Okay, there. Um, I have a blog um, article that's, Oh my gosh, I'm blanking out on what it's called, but I think it's like, have you lost yourself or something like that? Or um, are you struggling with the boundaries basically? And there's a, kind of a Q&A, like a quiz. Uh, and again, you can get it on my website, but it's this, these questions that are similar to that boundary list, trying to help you assess in this relationship and this exchange that you have with uh, your loved one. Have you kind of lost your your grounding lost your bearings and it gives you a, a kind of a quick quiz to to help you assess that i just added your website oh, to the yeah. chat feature too so you can um can get the link for that as well do you find that people tend to have um the same uh unhealthy boundaries in all their relationships like is it I have a tendency to do this and it kind of patterns throughout my different relationships or do you think with this person I may have this unhealthy boundary but that on person I may have a different unhealthy boundary I mean do you have any sense of that I know right I'd say yes and no um, I think some people or I've seen a lot of people some of the most powerful I'll just use the example of women some of the most powerful women I know who are kind of kicking butt in, in the corporate world are in these very toxic, emotionally exhausting, boundaryless relationships. Hmm. So I would say sometimes people do practice the same boundaries um, and then they don't. But I've, that's kind of the most common example that I see that these, there are these kind of take no, um, they don't take any crap kind of thing. They have extremely clear boundaries in settings with their friendships or in settings with their their business partners or colleagues, um, but man, they are getting rolled over in their relationships. Hmm. So I don't okay. know. I, yeah, that, that that's interesting. I also wonder if there is like um, certain periods of time, you know, like if we're more vulnerable about something, or mm -hmm. um, uh, like there were a couple of them. I was like, you know. Uh, I had a sister who uh, has was special needs and so you know, like all the family energy had to go and it, and the boundaries were obliterated because like all the attention needed to go to that particular person which you know I mean it is what it is but but I'm thinking wow if you look at that particular time I have a feeling that you know I kind of lost those boundaries in other areas too because that became a pattern that I was used to engaging in so yeah just fascinating so but I really do also believe that you know if we establish healthy boundaries for ourselves you know then we're more likely to be in relationships 
with other people who have healthier boundaries as well, you know, mm -hmm. that we're more on an, um, an even playing field, that we're coming into it on a, an even platform, so to speak, rather than you know, the power up, power down as well. So any questions from anybody? Um, you can type them in the Q&A. Kristen's happy to answer them. So. So I've been an expert on boundary setting already. <laughs> <laughs> but you shared, you know, like I found I wasn't doing these things, so I had to make changes. So, you know, I mean, that's how we, you know, I mean, I think that's how we get to be it, sort it of is. experts in this it, field as we do it by ourselves. So. Especially for the people that are coming into these webinars that are the betrayed partners, right? Um, I think that's just where it's going to be the most important to be figuring this whole boundaries thing out, right? Because A, your, your goal is to get to a more intimate, vulnerable, authentic type relationship, right? That maybe wasn't possible because there was lying and sneaking around and addiction involved and someone leading a double life, right? There was anything but authenticity going on. Um, and, and, but you don't want to expose yourself to more harm. You don't want to, uh, kind of just lay yourself out to, to be uh, beat up again is probably what you feel like. So boundaries are a, a really great way of feeling, taking back the power, you know, so you're not feeling like you're victimized, that you, you've established what is wrong and right and okay and acceptable for you. And you expect yourself to follow those boundaries as well, just like you expect others to do the same. It can be very empowering. And I'm often answering emails from people who are are wondering how do I find safe people to share with because they need an outlet to, but it's determining what's going to be the right boundary. You know, how much of my loved one's behavior can I share and with whom? Because I want to share it with everybody. I want to stand on the street corner and go, this is what he did to me. But you know, ultimately that ends up being problematic and has, you know, come back. Um, and been hurtful. Uh, you know, I know of a case, I know a couple of them where, you know, they, you know, stood up in a church and, you know, and he professed everything and then they were ostracized from the church, you know, mm -hmm. rather than being, you know, people coming around and saying, okay, we want to support you through all this. It, they were shunned. And so, so then they, further lost um, support. So, so finding a boundary of, you know, who is going to be the safe person to talk to, what can I share and how, you know, can I do that? I mean, that's a, a you know, another type of, of, of boundary in relationships, you know, to, to figure out so that it's not um, compromising either party of the relationship and preventing further rebuilding of trust and, and, and support, so. Right, and, and let me add too, that if you have been victimized from your childhood down to like your present day, so meaning someone has either because you were a child and didn't really have a voice or as an adult, the same things happen. If they have invaded your, your boundaries, so to speak, they've, people have touched you inappropriately or you've asked for a need to be met and they've just kind of trampled over it metaphorically that will all unconsciously kind of lead you to believe, okay, well, my boundaries don't matter. You know, this is purposeless. Um, so it is always really interesting to look back for someone who is, um, I guess, afraid of setting boundaries or is really confused by this subject matter. I think of this one story of this woman that told me she'd been sexually abused um, by someone when she was young. And her first day of trauma treatment with the therapist had her stand up at the back of the room and the therapist has said, okay, well, I'm going to keep walking towards you. And you tell me when you, you know, want me to stop coming into your space. And she said, the therapist kept taking steps and she's like, you feel comfortable with this now? Yeah, I'm fine. Do you comfortable with it now? Yep. Fine. And she said, the therapist walked all the way up to her till her nose practically touched hers. And she said, what about now? And she's like, yeah, I'm no fine. Way. And she said that now in retrospect, she just realized that she was so used to someone not respecting her physical, her emotional limitations. They just got plowed through, through such victimization that she never even realized that she had any right 
to set a boundary, to say that's not okay, to even have a physiological response inside her to be like, dude, give me my space, back off. Um, and I thought that was an incredible story to kind of demonstrate uh, why this whole boundaries issue is so hard and why it's so important to, to kind of bring it back into your life. So there's a question. Um, boundaries are what I'm currently working on as I meet with my own therapist. It turns out one of the hardest things I'm learning, I didn't really have boundaries set before. It, you know, that, that is so often true, you are not alone. One question I have is I want to say I don't want to feel manipulated or pressured into sex with my husband. Is this an okay boundary to set for myself? The fact that the two words you used is manipulated and pressured is a pretty obvious sign of what your interpretation is of that situation, in my opinion. So if at any time you feel like you are being manipulated and pressured, those words usually relate to being victimized, right? Doing something against your will, something you don't want to do, something someone's trying to talk you into or make you guilt you into. Um, and that will leave you feeling passive aggressive or directly aggressive, right? Mm -hmm. That's that, you know, that's that same mantra, the choosing discomfort over resentment. If I feel like I'm being manipulated and I'm being pressured, I will absolutely be resentful. That's a normal response. So often it helps to choose the discomfort of maybe being less pleasant. Um, another thing that comes up for me too is uh, what are the shame voices that come through your head? if you don't have sex with him. You know, this is, this is me projecting, uh, but you know, if I don't have sex with him, he's just gonna get it somewhere else. He's gonna think that I'm not, you know, whatever, fill, fill in that blank. But it, that's what I was talking about. That very first part is that you have to practice self-love and shame resilience, is you really gotta tune in. Okay, so if I don't have sex with him and I set that boundary, what comes up inside of me? What, what are like the voices in my head? That's my way of interpreting it. You know, I kind of that, get that interior monologue out. Well, then I'm going to be that square boring person that he accused me of being or that I'm not, you know, trying as hard in the relationship by trying to get physically intimate with him, whatever. But you need to be in touch with those, those voices. And I'm wondering, what does sex represent to him? You know, what, what mm -hmm. is it? Um, you, now you forgive me, or now we're good, or is right. it escape for him? You know, I, I don't know how long he's been in recovery. And, um, you know, and, and there's an absence period that's recommended uh, by trained therapists, you know, so that, that their brains cool down and whatever. But, um, uh, you know, we, we talk on other webinars and things too about, you know, why would you have, want to have sex with somebody when you're feeling manipulated or pressured? Why would you want to have sex with somebody that you don't trust? So, right. so until the, the, there's um, an opportunity, I mean, I think it'd be, you know, I think having a conversation with them and say, what, what does this mean for you? What, you know, what do you perceive from this, you know, and, and getting his perspective, because it may be completely different than what you're making up in your head. Like as Kristen said, the voices in you, the voices in my head say one thing and reality can be completely different, you totally. know? So, so, you know, I, but I, I, you know, if you're rebuilding a trust and rebuilding a relationship, having a difficult conversation about, you know, here's what, how I feel. And, you know, this is what a boundary is for me. And I want, you know, I want to have sex with you, but I want it to be, you know, X, Y, and Z because, you know, then, then I will feel safe, you know, or whatever. So that's, that was my thoughts on that. Anybody else have any questions? That was a great question. And, you know, sex it, it, for sex and porn addicts is often, you know, a huge, you know, what do I do boundary? So that was, that was a, um, a good one. So. Anything else you can think of to share on boundaries? And we love having questions. It's really helpful. Sorry, so, yeah, no, no, I'm thinking, Chris. I'm looking around and seeing yeah. it there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, other than that, I think a really good starting place is I should have had the article ready um, for um, have you lost your boundaries or are you struggling with kind of your self worth and identity and stuff like that? 
And again, let me caveat that. That's not me saying that there's any kind of blame and that any of the victimization that's happened to you is because you've struggled with your self-worth or any of that. I'm just trying to give you tools to get out of, of this pain and struggling. So I want you to make sure to know that. And like I said, the boundaries is another way of you kind of being able to take the boundaries or I'm sorry, take the power back. So um, that, that, that quiz of um, have I lost myself or I don't even remember how I named it of um, how, how, when I'm that molecule atom bouncing off other people, what does it look like? Am I being judgmental? Am I feeling exhausted every day? Am I saying yes when I really meant to say no? Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a really good way to kind of get your mind in track so you're thinking about it. Yeah, I, you know, I, I like the idea too of doing the daily inventory, you know, taking this checklist and kind of going through and going, you know, I did really well on that one today. That one I could have done a little better, but even just having that reminder and, and thinking it through. So tomorrow, maybe I'll choose to be a little bit better in the healthy boundary side. Um, you know, and, and it's a, like at, with everything else, I think it's practice, you know, so, so, and we're humans, we're going to not be perfect at it, but, you know, just making progress, you know, in that, I, I think is a sense of empowering too. Well, if nobody has any other questions, I guess, you know, I think um, we, like I said, we, we're happy to answer other questions, but otherwise, uh, Kristen's on every two weeks. I'm, I think next week we'll have a drop-in group for um, partners at this time frame. So watch for the information for that. How, let me tell you how this will be structured. The drop-in group will be such that you'll be able to see each other. There will be a moderator. Um, Brittany is planning to be here and she will um, open it up and do, a, you know, a, maybe share a topic. Um, we'll know more about that. Those are going to just start next week, but um, then you'll be able to see each other. You can share. It's not a 12 step meet, meeting, but it will be a support group and you'll be able to talk to each other and share your experience, strength and hope and um, uh, talk about the topic or whatever, but uh, there will be a moderator there to help guide the process. So, so watch for information. We'll have them for a men's sex addiction group. Um, and I, that one will start either next week or the following week. The, the partners, we're going to have a gay man's um, uh, sex addict group. And we also have someone who has um, offered to run a Spanish speaking one. So there will be um, an opportunity for that. And we do have another question, so we won't close. But, but we do have, so if any of you uh, speak fluent Spanish or know people that do, there will be a resource coming for that as well. Much needed. And, and we, you know, we, I'm, I only speak English, so that, you know, I can't help with, but um, it, I'm looking forward to having that. So here's a question. I'm in a relationship with a sex addict. We've been together for almost two years, and he's seeing a therapist and getting treatment when we started dating, and he chose to be open and told me about it at the beginning of the relationship. That's great. How do I deal with my insecurities and fears that he can act out someday? Uh, yeah, I know. That's a, a really great question. Um, how do you deal with the insecurities and fears, right? It's, that's kind of like what, what stuff is on your side of the street and then what stuff is on his side of the street. Uh, I said the, one of the first parts about, uh, practicing intimate, vulnerable, authentic relationships is to practice self-love and to have shame resilience from this idea that you're, you're not enough, that you're unlovable or you're not worthy. Um, so just make sure you're always checking that, but at the same time, you have instincts and intuition, um, choose the discomfort of asking questions. If you feel like, um, I, I always joke, it's like, I call it your spidey sense. If your spidey sense starts tingling, you feel like he's disconnected, you you're just noticing curious behaviors that are making you wonder if he's acting out again. Um, you have every right to kind of explore that topic and, and see if he's willing to have that uncomfortable conversation with you. You know, make sure that you pay attention to those voices in your head that's like, oh my gosh, am I going to be that really insecure girlfriend that's like, oh, you know, you've been distant lately. Um, what's going on with you? Are you acting out? Are you engaged in your old behaviors, whatever they may be? Um, and have that uncomfortable conversation. 
And I think like these drop in groups, finding support with other people that are going through the same thing, you know, I, I think that'll be super helpful for you as well. Um, you know, like in any relationship, there's no guarantee, um, you know, when you're, when you're involved that, in fact, it's probably the only guarantee when you're in a relationship is that it's not going to be perfect all the time. So, you know, so there's always going to be stuff that comes up. Um, you know, I, I think it's important. I see a, a really hopeful thing that he, was clear about it, you know, up front. And so, you know, that, you know, he's not trying to hide things and things like that. That's, that's a really good thing. And I think just like Kristen said, you know, you're voicing your, your concerns and, and, and saying, okay, oh, today I feel a little insecure, you know, can, can I just talk about that? Not trying to guilt him or anything else, but you're just sharing. So. And, and one more thing too, is that last sentence, I just reread it. How do I deal with my insecurities and fears that he can act out someday? Mm -hmm. I love concreteness. I love uh, certainty, but it is also <laughs> seems like those who want to control the most and, and experience only the certain things in life I've found personally have been the most unhappiest people. And so I have tried to do a lot of letting go and surrendering to the fact that my husband might cheat on me. Um, I might cheat on him. He may come home one day and say, you just don't do it for me. Or he could get hit by a bus. These are all daily uncertainties that I, I have to walk with. You know, the same bad things could happen to my children. Bad things ha can happen to this world. And I try to find peace and serenity if you have a higher power in your higher power. And the fact that this world is messy and bad stuff happens. And the more I try to control it, the crazier I become. <laughs> and I, I, yes, have those uncomfortable conversations. Yes, do your best to feel safe and not be victimized. But there has to be a level of surrendering that that is another human being. And you ultimately, all you can do is be the best person that you can be and keep your side of the street clean, but he's going to make his own choices, sometimes good, sometimes bad. And it's that unfortunate thing that you have no control over that. I try to remember that, you know, my husband's great, but you know, he disappoints me now and then. And then I would go, you know, and I know I disappoint him, you know, it, it's just, we, we can't do it perfectly. And so, you know, we're just doing the best we can. So there, there's a follow-up question. Uh, to the first one, are you suggesting that I need to have forgiven him before we have sex again? And I would say forgiveness takes a long time. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, thoughts on that? Uh, I, that is such a personal question. To me, that's just as personal as the, am I ready to leave? You know, no, no therapist should ever be giving guidance or opinions on that. That is just such a personal journey that you have to kind of sit with. You obviously don't want to feel manipulated or pressured. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I, I have heard stories, so I'll just fall to my stories of people who haven't quite been able to get there with the intimacy because there's still so many trust issues. And they did go down the path of kind of playing with the sexual stuff to see if it was going to ignite um, some healthier intimacy and connection. And sometimes it's worked and sometimes it hasn't. So. I, it, yeah, I, yeah, I think it's one of those, if you're not, you know, if you're in a place where you're not feeling manipulated or coerced, you know, then maybe sex is on the table, but otherwise, you know, I think you'll know when you're ready. There's a question in a um, uh, in the chat. So I've recently spoken to a peer who shared her trauma scores were lower this last time she saw our therapist. Do you know what that is? Is there a test that we can get scored on? Oh, maybe that trauma. I think it's the PT. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. there there is one uh, that trained therapists have access to. Um, the post-traumatic stress uh, inventory. Um, I know the CSAT trained therapists, CSAT trained therapists have access to those. Um, uh, I don't know if there's a, you know, an online version other than that. That one's, you know, creates a graph and everything else. But, um, uh, and usually that that's interesting because the post, here's my thinking on that. The post-traumatic stress inventory 
the scores actually typically go up. So I'm, I'm wondering if I've got the right test because this, the test scores typically go up as people are more able to dive in and understand more of their comprehensive trauma history. So it, it, they may not be reacting to the trauma as much in the moment, but they'll have identified more items. So the score actually usually goes up. So that makes me kind of wonder if there is not something else that you know, I, I think I just asked your peer, I mean, what, you know, what specifically did they take? Um, uh, because um, th that would be reversed from what the test that I'm thinking of, you know, would indicate. So, oh, oh it was, yeah, okay. If it was a CSAT, like I said, that is counterintuitive to me because uh, that, like I just said, is, you know, the, the more you're able to identify, the more trauma you have, in your background, that doesn't mean you're reacting to it. So hopefully that helps. Okay, um, let's see, there was something else. Uh, I'm doing my, so someone says, thank you, I'm doing my best to be the best of me and realize I can't control everything. And although it's not always on my mind, there's this ever present fear that he gives in. So, I mean, you know, we've talked about some like EMDR or somatic experience or something like that. Um, you have any thoughts on helping get past fear. <laughs> you were frozen for a moment. So did, did you hear the question? No, I didn't. Okay, so, um, so the person that asked one of the questions said, um, it, it, she's doing her best to not, um, to, to always be the best of her and realize I can't control everything. And although it's not always on my mind, it's like there's this ever present fear. And I'm just wondering if there's like, you know, EMDR or somatic experience, any, anything like that that could help. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, thoughts on that? You, you are much better versed <laughs> which one would be, I mean, I don't even know. Is there something that could help go through the fear? Oh man, I know, right? Because this is, I think, so many people's issues, right? You are, this is here in lies a problem with why vulnerability is so tough. You are putting yourself out there, showing your good, your bad, your light, your dark, and you're hoping that someone just doesn't, you know, take that heart of yours and throw it in the trash. Um, for me personally, I, I had to do a lot, a lot, a lot of work on being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, I'm a, such a control freak and I so want everything to go exactly the way I want it to go. And I personally had a really, really, really low tolerance level um, for things not going the way I wanted them to be. So I, a spiritual practice has helped me with that. It's helped me with surrendering um, the more it's strange, the more I realize, as you were saying about with you and your husband, the more I realize that I'm flawed and I fall short every single day. And, uh, the more I feel the need to be, uh, uh tolerant of other people's flaws. Um, so I'm one of those people, you know, Brene Brown says that there's people that will either puff up their chest and kind of pretend to be bigger than they really are because they're in a state of shame and insecurity. And then there's those people that like kind of pull out and isolate and just don't even engage because they can't handle the rejection. I'm like a chest puffer outer. I'm like, I'm better than everybody. Hi, nice to meet you. These are my credentials. This is all the ways that I'm better than you. And so I, I constantly have to have a humbling practice where I remind myself that I am no better than anybody else. Um, and you need to, to love everybody where they're at um, and accept others. You can love and accept people for who they are, but not be okay with their behaviors and, and call them out when the mistakes are made. I don't know if that helps you or not. One of the things I'm, you know, in a 12 step community and the 12 or the serenity prayer was a huge, you know, has been hugely beneficial for me um, because it's a reminder to me that I have no control over people, places, things, all of those other things. The only thing I have control of on some level is my actions and reactions mm -hmm. to those people, places and situations. So there, there have been times when I have, said it like a mantra just over and over again where I'm going like I've got you know no control over all of all of that other stuff you know and and how can I, I change how I'm 
I would rather act than react. And so it, having to take a pause to go, now how can I act instead of react, you know, help me shift a little bit to, you know, from that. But it, but it is a challenge and, you know, and it's no fun to deal with, you know, like this oppressive fear hanging on your shoulder, just waiting to lurch. So, so, you know, I mean, stuff is going to happen and uh, just the resiliency that you talked about, um, you, you know, like I really believe that you know, I, w somehow, no matter how bad things are, you know, I've somehow managed to come through it. And I don't believe that I've just been dropped off at the spot to, you know, flounder now. So, you know, having support, having, you know, people knowing that there are some people that can help me get through that difficult moment. So if the worst happens and he acts out, you know, it, it, it would be bad, it would be hurtful and whatever. But if he got back into a program and what, I mean, there's lots of people that have that happen and there's people that never have that happen. So, so you just don't know. But I believe if you're in a loving relationship, your relationship can survive that and even thrive after that. So, um, so waiting for the shoe to drop, it, you know, isn't particularly, you know, as useful as embracing the current moment and, you know, enjoying what right. you've got in the moment. So any other questions or comments? Let me see if I miss anything. I guess not. So then I would invite you, um, you'll receive more, e if, you, if you haven't already registered on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, um, you'll be able to receive an email with links to the webinars. John, Taylor is doing one on Mondays at noon Pacific time. And then Rob is doing one. We may change the time uh, next Monday to 5 p.m. Pacific time. So watch for that. And Kristen is doing these every other week. David Fawcett has a, a webinar the opposite Wednesdays um, at five o'clock um, Pacific time. So there's more opportunities. Drop-in groups are coming. If you're registered, you'll receive the information, but we appreciate you coming. I heard that there was a link issue. I'm gonna to talk to Scott and make sure we don't have that again. Frustrating for me. It's been a technology week. I had a few challenges with that. I apologize you know, for any of those, uh, any of you that had any difficulty getting in, but we're grateful you did. So, and uh, if you missed the first part of this, we're gonna, this was recorded, so we're gonna add it to the website so you can go watch the first part of it. And the link to Kristen's a website with the healthy versus unhealthy boundaries chart, you know, is in the chat feature. Uh, so hopefully you uh, go in and snag that for yourself as well. So thank you, Kristen, as always. I so mm -hmm. appreciate you doing this, taking time. Kristen donates her time to do this. So, you know, she is just doing this because she loves to, loves, loves to help all of us out here. So, so appreciate it. Thank you. It's my all right. pleasure. Thanks. Bye. Bye.